The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight, we continue our series of political debates in our 2021 Bronx primary debate series. Over a period of two weeks, we're presenting debates in each of the borough's eight council districts, as well as the race for borough president, nine programs in all on BronxNet television. Tonight, we have only one of the two candidates who are running in the borough's 17th council district, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Concourse Village, Cretona Park East, East Tremont, Hunts Point, Longwood, Melrose, Morrisania, Port Morris, West Farms, North Brother Island, and South Brother Island. Tonight's program is presented in conjunction with the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization that advocates for informed and active participation in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. And also with CityLimits.org, an online news source for New York City that exists to inform democracy and equip citizens to create a more just city. Other sponsors tonight are Naleo, Dominicanos USA, the Bronx Times, and the Norwood News. The Democratic primary is on June 22nd, and all eligible voters are urged to vote. The absentee ballot request deadline is June 15th. Absentee ballots have to be postmarked by June 22nd. The early voting period is from June 12th to June 20th. And uh, please note, this is a ranked choice election, so you can indicate your top five choices on your ballot. For more information uh, on voting in uh, this primary, you visit vote.nyc. Unfortunately, uh, this evening, the incumbent, Rafael Salamanca Jr., chose not to make himself available for tonight's program. But fortunately, the challenger is here. She is currently a member of Black United Leadership in the Bronx. That's Bulb. She served as a board member on Community Board 9's Community Action Board and is vice president of an NAACP branch in the Bronx. So please join me in welcoming Helen Hines to Bronx Talk. Nice to have you with us, Ms. Hines. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Let's uh, just get right to it. Why don't you lay out for us why you said, now here's an incumbent who um, is highly popular, frankly, who uh, is well respected in the city council, has seniority in the city council. Um, wh why did you say, you know what, this is something I ought to do in challenging? Well, the reason for, um, if you notice that um, prior to um, the city councilman decided that he was going to run for borough president. So with that being said, I decided then, okay, let me give it another shot. And who's best fitted for the job is me, Helen Hines. So with him leaving, going to run for borough president starting November and out in the field, introducing his uh, predecessor, I said, oh, I'm back in New York. Let me throw my head, hand in the race. And here I am. Ready. So here you, here you are, even though ultimately history will show that um, Mr. Salamanca decided not to run for borough president and um, he's uh, running for city council. I, I guess in retrospect, you say, gee, maybe I wouldn't have done this if he were uh, still in, in, you know, hadn't, uh, you know, done that. Or is this something you really think um, needs to be done and you want to, um, you know, uh, accede to that that level? Based on listening to the residents um, that's in the district, it's something that's needed. They feel that, um, or at least they uh, brought it to my attention that they have been uh, short on many things and that they need someone to run that's going to be there for them. And um, with that being said, that's again, the reason that I'm running. You know, I've got a list of uh, items which many of the districts, frankly, in the Bronx um, residents are saying, you know what, we got to fix this, we got to change this. Um, what's at the, give me the, the item that's at the top of your list. You say, residents say, and you believe this needs to be addressed and has not been addressed adequately uh, so far in the 17th. 
Well, one of the things that we, we stand for for some time now, uh, prior to uh, the city councilman coming in, is affordable housing, the quality education that we still don't have and is underserved, um, the fact that the economy um, is bad, there's still no jobs, um, families are not able to make ends meet, there's no food, the food is given during the election time for political clout. Um, there's also a senior problem where because of the pandemic, there, things are shut down. They are not able to communicate and that's not good to keep the mind going. The healthcare issue still stands there and the community safety is definitely an issue. Well, you've just laid out the agenda for our dialogue today. Oh. Uh, so so I, I do appreciate you doing that. Let's start off with housing. Now, uh, there was a rezoning plan for uh, Southern Boulevard, and the councilman said, you know, I'm not going to permit that to go through, frankly, as it had in on Jerome Avenue and in another part of the Bronx, because he felt that it was not clear uh, who was going to be displaced, whether residents would be displaced or businesses would be displaced. This was one way to create, allegedly, to create housing. What, in your mind, is a method that could be used to increase the uh, amount of affordable housing? Of course, as everything gets more expensive. Well, the, the problem that we seem to have in District 17 is that the affordable housing could never, ever meet the qualifications of the residents to the fact that the, um, they have been saying for the longest that the threshold is just too high. And because of the threshold, it, it seems that as if folks are being displaced. Um, and they are no longer able to maintain in the Bronx where they grew up and where they live and not too far from their parents and, and their relatives so that they can shift their kids from one place to the other while they're running to work. So a, um, uh, uh, as a council member, um, you know, there are many factors that go into the creation of housing and into the establishment of uh, the AMI and all these other, as you call them, thresholds. Uh, what do you say to developers who say, you know what? I can't spend the money to number one, build the kind of housing uh, that that is, is respectable. And certainly we wouldn't want to put anything in that's not respectable. Um, I can't build that kind of housing unless I get some of it back. And how, how do you work that out so that a developer can look at a project or look at a piece of land and say, okay, I'm going to build this up, but we're going to uh, make it either all affordable or a percentage really affordable. Well, it's very difficult in this economy to even say really, really affordable. <laughs> <laughs> Please excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> we know that. Um, but the problem that we're having in this is the annual salaries for folks. It, it's just, we seem to be stuck. Um, folks are just not making it. And it just came to the point where it's $15 an hour. There's no jobs. Things have been shut down there for since March of 2019. Um, it, it, yeah, we're just having a hard time. And for a developer to come in and say that they want a fair market price or they want um, $2,500 when folks are making $20,000 annual salary, that's kind of rough for us. Yeah, that uh, that that uh, doesn't work. So as, as I am well aware and you are well aware, all things are interconnected. Let's talk then about uh, jobs. Now, uh, the reports that are coming on the national scene, I can't quite say that it's the case in the Bronx, is that there is a glut of uh, uh, workers. We don't have, uh, restaurant owners are saying we don't have enough workers. Um, wh what's the job situation like? How do we get more Bronx sites uh, with appropriate jobs that can obviously uplift them, uplift their families, and then maybe even out that uh, economy for affordable housing that you were just talking about? Well, I think there needs to be a discussion with labor unions so that we can have an opportunity to have folks trained. We need to go back into the school system and make sure that people are trained there so that people are ready for jobs. The college is not for everyone. So we wanna make sure that the kids are trained, um, carpentry, um, you name it. Um, 
They can be trained in um, building service, maintenance, uh, health care. And if we do that, and then in those uh, labor unions as well, they have an opportunity to have two credits per semester to go to school to enhance their education and get into other programs that the city has so that they can pull themselves up by the bootstrap instead of saying, pull yourself up by the bootstrap and there, there's no boots. And there's no way, um, uh, obviously, to do that. You know, I think the dialogue, and I've had this with many of the candidates who are running for office, and they say, well, college is not for everybody. But I think of somebody who, you know, maybe gets into construction, but then goes to college or gets a college degree or gets an engineering degree, that person not only will be able to work in construction, but then become a manager or even have an executive position. And then they really could afford a lot more. So I'm always sensitive to that, although I am sympathetic to the notion that we really need to uh, improve our education of trades and, and those kinds of things in schools. Well, Gary, one of the things that we should um, uh, look into the fact that we have to understand our children and how they are growing up. You, we're talking about at some point children raising children, and then the fact that there is a need for the money in the household in order to pay the rent, in order to put the food on the table. So some kids, for that reason, are not able to move forward. So that's why I said that it needs to be better understanding of community relation and families and what it is that they need. We need to have a discussion for them to say, how can we help as the but, government? How can we entice yeah. you to move forward? So let's, I mean, now that we have the time, I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not limited to one minute sound bites here as we would in a debate. Um, if you're a city council member, how do you engage that dialogue so you can have the information? Then of course, if you have to stand in front of a committee or testify and, or you know, make a speech in, in city hall, that, um, that information is then communicated into governmental action. Well, we have to have a town hall meetings in the various areas, District 17 is huge. So we have to break it down and have various meetings so that the district, the people in the district will be able to say what it is that they need, what it is they would like to see and how the government can support them in order to allow them to uh, move forward. The problem is no one goes to the resident and asks them what the needs are. It seems to be people are making decisions for the resident as opposed to having that discussion. You know, I, I'm in, obviously in the communications business and when we analyze problems, so many times I say it's a communications problem. And in many ways, what you're expressing here is that it is a communications problem. I've been doing this TV program for a number of years, as you know. I would say in terms of my own dialogue with parents, the one thing that comes up over and over and over again, what are my kids doing after school? What are they doing after school? So um, just taking a look at the culture of our young people, how does a council member affect that give them productive activities after school when uh, budgets are, have been cut for arts and, and music programs, budgets have been cut at uh, some of our wonderful community centers, Eastside House Settlement. I mean, I know all the uh, community centers in the South Bronx. Um, wh what do we do to, to, to re reinvigorate that industry so that the kids do have something to do after school? Well, I think that the, the funding have to be redirected. And, and that is one of the reasons why I believe that um, so often you hear people say, defund the police. I knew that was where you were going. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about, I'm telling you, they don't make enough. The firemen, police, the uh, healthcare workers, they are not making enough. But however, we need to get there. So when people say defund the police, they are not saying take money away from the police. What I would like to see is some of that money shift and I put find money to put into the programs so that we can develop our young children so that they can move forward. They can have a better opportunity for an education in, in underserved neighborhoods. I, I, I mean, I'm just, summer youth employment becomes at the top of the list. Those kinds of things, you know, it, it's always been some, SYEP has always been one of these uh, 
well, we'll see if we have money at the end of the budget, and then they fund it. Many people have argued for a long time that summer youth employment should be a budget line, and it should have a regular funding from the city of New York. Can I assume you think that's the kind of thing that if you were in the council, you'd push for? Absolutely, because um, we shouldn't be trying to figure out our children's education. We should have money set aside and ready for them. If we're not educating them, what happens to Social Security? What happened to uh, the way of life once we get to that age where we are ready to retire? Of course, I retired twice already. I, I was <laughs> going to say, I'm not a present company, including me, excluded from this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> But we have to prepare our youth so that they can carry on the world. Um, I, I want to do one more thing that is, of course, interrelated with all this. Every, everything is connected. And then I've got another uh, issue for you. And that's the notion of crime. Crime is up. Hate crimes are up. Uh, we've got, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of small crimes where you have uh, uh, young people generally uh, driving autos with loud exhausts in the middle of the night, disturbing whole communities. Um, number one, why do you think we have this spike right now? And number two, how do we deal with it? I mean, the de I don't like the phrase defund the police, but let's talk about how do we deal with, you know, criminal justice when people don't trust police in the Bronx in many cases. And then also we need to keep our police motivated. Let's, let's be honest, without a motivated police force, we're all in trouble. Some people think that's partially why uh, crime has gone up in New York. So give me your vision of all that. Well, one of the things that I believe when, when I say uh, defund the police or, or hear that term is just shove them the money around. Just shove them the money around and having programs so that the police department and the community can grow together so that we can understand one another and respect one another. Because the problem is, as you know, the police officer doesn't live in the community that they serve. So that's one of the agitations. They don't know our kids. Our kids don't know them. And the diversity that's in the community is a lot. So because someone speak this way or that way, the officer gets offended or the child gets offended. And here goes the creation of a uh, problem arising on the way. So if we spend some of that money to get people to understand each other and the diversity um, and educate, put money in there so that folks can be educated and move forward, I think we'll have a better, much, much better community. Many people believe, um, just looking from a financial point of view, that uh, uh, and some of the analyses I've seen of the, the city council budgets that are being negotiated right now is that using uh, the stimulus monies that are coming from the federal government in this way is going to be very good. But in the long run, it's going to leave a hole because then we don't know what we're going to do in three years or five years. Um, how, how do you see the structure of, of the city's budget? And if you're a council member, I, I realize you're going to advocate for these things. But of course, there's got to be a larger picture to this. I mean, the money is just, it's, you know, it's not eternal. You can't just take as much as you want. It's not like the, the city has to have a balanced budget. They can't keep borrowing like the federal government. Well, no, we can't keep borrowing at the federal level. But however, it's going to be rough for all of us. So we will have to get in the room and make the best decision for the economy and the people that we serve. So it's and a matter of, for you, a matter of values, obviously. That's correct. Um, something that you have um, kind of um, high profile on your website, it's centrally uh, located, uh, which not a lot of candidates talk about as senior citizens and how we can improve the lives of um, senior citizens. What, what are problems that senior citizens in the 17th Council District have uh, that you think really need to be taken a look at? Well, one of the problems is the uh, buses. Buses doesn't travel like they used to, but before the buses, I would like to talk about the fear that they have of leaving their homes because of all the crime um, and not sure if they're going to get caught up in a uh, crossfire or not sure if the elevator is working and they're going to be able to get back upstairs. So it's just a host of things uh, for the seniors. Um, sometimes I hear the seniors say, oh, I, I don't have money to get my medication this month. Um, two pills short or whatever the case may be. And I just talk to them and I call the pharmacy and say to the pharmacy, hey, I need favors here. You know, how can we help the senior? 
And the pharmacy in the area where I live and other areas where I've reached out to seem to be pretty good in understanding of the uh, community and the folks that live in the community. So things are working out, but it's difficult. You know, that's a, a fascinating thing. And, and certainly a, a give one of these to, you know, our friends who are pharmacists who are sympathetic. Of course, that's not the way to do this. <laughs> I mean, let's let's be honest. We certainly don't want to put the financial burden on, on our local pharmacists. We need them to be strong financially as well. These are um, issues largely for the state and federal government uh, to figure out how to lower the prices, uh, you know, universally on um drug prices. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, senior citizen centers. Um, are, are, do we have enough of them? Are they serving the, the community properly? Is Because that's a city thing that could really be looked at and say, you know, we've got to do, you tell me, X, Y, or Z. For me, they are not being serviced properly. I don't believe the funding is there for them to be serviced properly. And I say that only because when I go from center to center and they're gathering to get ready for a trip, you find that people that don't have want to attend the trip and what they have to do is pull from the east or the north or the west to be able to go on the trip. So what that means is that they are pulling from other fundings funds that they have in order to be a part of. Yeah. And Ro excuse me, robbing Peter to pay Paul is what you're well, saying. Yes, that's what and my grandmother that's... would say. <laughs> well, kudos, that's you know, that's... shout out to grandma. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you. So that's a problem for me. Um, so we need to be able to have some type of funding there and to assist what they are getting so that they will be able to keep their minds going and, and be able to come down to the centers, do the art crafts and the things that they would like to do in order to keep their mind flow. Is there enough money for these kinds of things out there? I mean, I mean, to me, you know, a lot of candidates talk about a lot of things they'd like to do. Money's got to come from somewhere. Is, is the money in the budget, and and it's just a matter of reapportioning and relooking at a budget. I, as I work for a city councilman, I think it's, it's a matter of where you want to put your money. Where do you believe your money is best suited? And in order to know this is you have to be out in the mix of things. You have to be out in the district talking to folks to know what's needed for your district. And sometimes I believe it's just a matter of shifting a couple of dollars more over here as opposed to shifting it to Brooklyn to some other event. Uh, or um, also a, a council member has discretionary funds. I think we're getting, if you are a council member, uh, where you would uh, start looking at putting uh, some of those monies. Let's talk about, uh, before we run out of time, let's talk about health care. Uh, obviously, the Bronx was devastated. We were all devastated uh, by COVID. We know how bad it was. But the underlying uh, issues that of why we got uh, so badly hurt was obviously poverty. We could start there, but access to general health care, um, all the epidemics we seem to be fighting all the time, which frankly often you know originate in the South Bronx, whether it be uh, uh, asthma and other airborne diseases, obesity. Um, certainly, there's um, significant uh, drug issues and overdose issues uh, in in the South Bronx. Um, a lot of candidates are talking about putting, uh, you know, we, we need more access, so we'll put new clinics and things. How do we do that? Is, that? is that what we need to do? Is it more a matter of health education? Talk to me about how we get the general populace healthier. Well, I, one of the things I think we should start doing is making sure that the centers or the clinics that they do have in place are ran properly funded so that they can have the supplies that they need. Because often what really uh, agitate me is the fact that you go attend a, a doctor's office in the Bronx and you end up going there, but yet that you get a prescription that you have to go to their Manhattan office for to take an exam or for an x-ray. And that, and that service is not available in the local community. Right. So that's a waste of time. And it's happening more and more and more. And it happened before COVID. So 
we need to organize different and we need to bring the same service from Manhattan to the Bronx if you're a doctor in the area. You know, you know, I have to tell you, I have not heard that. And that, uh, that is, uh, and, and you think about somebody who's ailing for whatever reason, the last thing they need <laughs> is to be told, well, you're having breathing problems, but in order to deal with it, you got to go to some service downtown. That, I, I don't follow that, you know. It's yeah. like a, where I'm from, we'd say that's Meshuga. That makes no sense. Right. But no, it happens because um, even myself, I find myself going to Manhattan on 77th Street for x-ray, EKG, uh, mammography, whatever I have to get. Because when you go to the centers in the Bronx, first of all, it takes forever to get an appointment. It's a delay in service when you get there. There's no staff. So it's just easier if you just find your way downtown. Do you, you know, just to kind of wrap it up before we get out of time, and I'll give you a chance to, you know, take about a minute or two to make a final statement. But um, why aren't these things being done now? What, what I mean, the, the way we're discussing it, and we've both been in the Bronx a little while, sounds very logical. What, what is your challenge to uh, the current council member? And why do you need to do that? Because that's not happening. I think there's conversation, I, communication. You'll always hear me talk about communication, the lack of communication, the lack of understanding, lack of education. Um, and someone that's been in the healthcare since 1970, um, went to 1199 in 89, um, stayed there until 19, no, 2015. I'm well aware of what goes on in these various clinics, whether it's the Bronx or another borough. Um, we need to decide on and having a conversation with someone that can make a difference in the matter and get it done. It's not a rocket scientist. Get it done. Uh, Helen Hines is our guest, and uh, she is running for city council in the 17th uh, council district. Uh, we'll give you 60 seconds to just um, say whatever you'd like and, and kind of deliver a closing statement uh, for your candidacy. Well, for for me, um, my heart goes out. I've been a public servant for since I was a child, and I will continue to be a public servant. But in order to be a public servant, you need to go out and have conversation with people to understand the problem that they have. In the Bronx, I find in the 17th district, there's a lot of things that can be done that's not being dealt with. Um, for instance, I ride the district constantly, and I often hear in NYCHA's having a problem with the blueprint and how that's going to span. But luckily for them, uh, Kavanaugh backed off, so we're in a better position. We, they still going to go on with the June 10th rally and make that happen. Take, take another 15 seconds because we're going to have to go. Okay. Um, so being a public servant and being able to sit there and help folks is my pleasure and all beings be my pleasure. I would just like folks to know that, um, try me. Uh, <laughs> <and lose. laughs> all right, there you go. Helen Hines running for uh, city council. Well, thank you. So try me. There you go. Uh, Helen Hines running for city council in the 17th uh, council district. We appreciate your time this evening. For more information on voting in the June primary, visit vote.nyc. We also want to thank our collaborators, the League of Women Voters. For more information, call the League at 212-725-3541. Also, you can find City Limits at citylimits.org. Co-sponsors tonight, thanks to Naleo, Dominicanos USA, the Bronx Times, and Norwood News. We thank you for watching. Please Make sure you vote on June 22nd, and we'll see you around town. Good night.